Allah is now describing this is how close he came to the Prophet. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The distance between the string and the bow. When Najmi the Hawa, Ma Ladna Sahibukum, Wama Hawa. Behina TV doesn't just teach you about the Quran. You can also learn Arabic from a brilliant teacher. Ustad Naman Ali Khan has made this beautiful ancient language easy to understand. So you're not only improving your language skills, but your understanding of the Quran too. Tap now to check out Behina TV. We will, we left off at Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Du mirratin fastawa. Fastawa means he became upright. He became even. But istiwa means for something to be, you know, to, to even to stand up can be istiwa. Like fastawa ala suqihi in the Quran, when the, when the stalk stands up, when he stands tall. Fastawa ay fastaqama ala suratihi al haqiqiyah allati khalaqahu Allah ta'ala alayha. Fastawa here means Jibreel stood up and took his original form, the way Allah actually created him. Because when Jibreel came to the Prophet sallallahu in the angel, in the in the in the cave, he wasn't in his true form because he had to be able to fit inside the cave. But now Allah is describing an incident where Jibreel took his actual full form, incomplete, incomplete, uh, uh, full form. Then وَذَلِكَ عِنْدَ حِرَاءَ فِي مَبَادِئِ النُّبُوَةِ وَكَانَ لَهُ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةُ This was in the early stages of prophethood. There's a disagreement about when this happened. I'm more inclined to think this is the second meeting after the Iqra بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الَّذِي خَلَقْ this is the second meeting. There was a gap in revelation. And then Rasul saw him again. And when he saw him again, he had taken over the entire sky. That's when he went and he said, cover me and all of that happened. So th there, are, there are some discrepancies in the narrations, but it seems to me that this is when the full viewing happened. Not the original meeting where the Iqra Bismi Rabbika Ladi Qalaq. Because that was not Fastawa. And he, he wasn't on the horizon then. Okay? Anyway. كَبَا فِي حَدِيثٍ أَخْرَجَهُ الْإِمَامُ أَحْمَدْ وَعَبْدُ وَعَبْدُ بْنُ حُمَيْدٍ وَجَمَاعَةٌ عَبْدٍ بِمَسْعُودٍ سِتَّ مِئَةِ جَنَاحٍ كُلُّ جَنَاحٍ مِنْهَا يَصُدُّ الْأُفُقِ So he says when he took his true form, those, those were some names of the narrators, it was 600 wings and each one of them was covering horizon after horizon. فَالِاسْتِوَاءُهَا هُنَا بِمَعْنَ اعْتِدَالِ الشَّيْءِ فِي ذَاتِهِ كَمَا قَالَ الرَّاغِبِ So this means that he was actually, he took his place. In one narration, it even describes he sat on a chair above the horizon and his wings just spanned over the entire, you couldn't see the sky anymore. All you could see was Jibreel. Like the entire sky, the entire horizon was just taken over by Jibreel alayhi salam. Okay? Uh, so, وَهُوَ الْمُرَادِ بِالْإِسْتِقَامَ لَا ضِدَّ الْإِعْوِجَاجِ So, istiwa here means standing upright. الثَّمْرِ إِذَا نَظَرِ That's actually linguistic commentary. So now, um, let me see if I want to read the rest of this to you or just explain it to you. Yeah, okay. I'll explain it to you. Allah will now describe how the Prophet experienced seeing Jibreel alayhi salam. And he already described this you know, the, the, the might of him, the traveling ability of him, now the meeting itself, the viewing him itself of this mighty angel. And when he took his form, he was on the highest horizon. Al-ufuqul a'la would mean right above the head. Some say this could mean on the right side, but actually the more, the ufuqul mubid, the, the clearest sky is the one right above your head. The, the east and the west, the north and the south, there's some discrepancy in your view. Buildings are in the way, or you know, uh, the, the, the trees are in the way, mountains are in the way. But the sky that is uninterrupted is one that's right above you. Al-ufuqul a'la. So Jibreel is being described as right above. I just, we can't even imagine this, but Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi is looking up and he's just seeing the horizon taken over by this magnificent being. And he recognizes him. So, وَهُوَ بِالْأُفُقِ الْأَعْلَى ثُمَّ دَنَا Then he started coming down. Now, can you imagine the level of intimidation? Then the Jibreel A.S. starts coming, descending. Then he says, فَتَدَلَّى Tadalla actually means then he started hovering low. Tadalla comes from the Arabic word dalwun. This is one of those words that I will remind you of tomorrow. You're going to need it tomorrow. He descended then he became, he was hanging like a bucket. 
Dalu actually means a well bucket. The one that has a rope on it. By the way, interesting. The rope is coming back again. You see that? So anyway, so he was hanging like a rope. Now, the thing with the, with the bucket is something is holding it from above, right? The imagery almost describes Jibreel alayhi salam is hovering and Allah is holding him up. You know? Like Allah describes about anything that flies, that Allah is the one, ma yumsikuhunna illa rahman right? Birds are not being held in the sky except by Ar-Rahman. Jibreel alayhi salam is being, imsak of him is being done in the sky. He's dangling in the sky, being held by Ar-Rahman. Beautiful language. Then Amin Ahsan Islahi talking about this in his Urdu tafsir, Tadabur al-Quran said something beautiful. It's as if, he says, it's as if when a teacher uh, lovingly leans over the student to see his work or to, to, to teach him or to whisper something to him or to tell him something that he doesn't want anybody else to hear. Tadalla, he hovered over. So this closeness to the Prophet ﷺ is being described in these words. Then, فَكَانَ قَابَ This is where things get really beautiful. Then he was about the distance of the arch of the arrow, of the, of the bow and arrow. This is going to be a little bit uh, uh, tough to explain. Allow me to take my time with this. You guys know what a bow and arrow is, right? Okay, so Qaba Qawsayn could mean two, one of two things. There's two ways you can look at it. They both have to do with the bow and arrow. One of those meanings is, so the bow is like the letter D, right? Everybody knows that? Okay. Half of the arch, not the whole D, half of the arch is a Qab. That's a Qab. The other half is the other Qab. The handle, the grip is in the middle. So when you grip the bow, one side is one Qab and the other side is the other Qab. You get it? Okay, so that's one meaning of the word Qab. Uh, and when he says Qab Qawsayni, one bow of two, one arch of two bows. Which is weird. You would say, you would expect him to say two arches of one bow. Right? This is a Qab and this is a Qab. So Qabay Qawsan. Two, two bows or two arches of one bow. But Allah didn't say that. He said Qaba Qawsayni. One bow of two arches. This is a strange expression. So, so, so or one arch of two bows. Then the other meaning you have to understand of Qab is okay, still imagine the, this is my ugly bow and arrow, but this bow and arrow, there's the string and then there's the arch. You know the distance between the string and the arch? The, the middle of the, the, the grip and the string. If you draw a straight line in the middle of that D, that d distance is called a Qab also. That's Qaba Qawsayni. Okay, so once again, you've got the bow and arrow. Imagine the middle of the string and the grip of the bow. The distance between the middle of the string and the grip of the bow, that's the, the, the part you're going to pull, right? That distance is called a Qab. I prefer, I lean over this meaning, some of the ulama lean on this meaning also. But we'll, we'll go to, to the second meaning too. Allah is now describing, this is how close he came to the Prophet. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The distance between the string and the bow. That's how close Jibreel Alayhi Salam came to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But then he said, and this was an expression used for people that are very close to each other. Man, these, this guy, these two guys are like Qaba Qawsayn. They're like so close to each other. He says he came so incredibly close to the Prophet. But then he says, no, Abu Adna, or even closer than that. Or even closer than that. It's describing this really deep connection between Jibreel alayhi salam and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, And it's also describing this relationship not as a relationship of intimidation. Because when you first read these ayat, mighty, taking over the horizon, powerful, intelligent, you know, the highest horizon. He, he took his full form, but now he is this close to the Prophet ﷺ. But even that doesn't describe close enough. So he says, The closeness is also important because the word wahi means to whisper something to someone that nobody else can hear. So it was important to describe how close Jibreel is to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so that when he speaks to him, it's just him and Rasulullah alayhi, alayhi wa sallam. You understand? 
So th- this is the, the, the encounter of meeting with Jibreel alayhi salam. But now we're going to dig into Ka- Ka- Kaaba Qawsayn and you'll learn something really epic from it. One of the, the weirder meaning was half the arch belonging to two bows. You know what that could mean? Half of arch from one bow and the half the arch from another bow. So Kaaba Qawsayn. So it's actually two bows, but they're, they're two of them are turning into one. Now listen to this. وَعَنْ مُجَاهِدْ وَالْحَسَنْ أَنَّ كَابَ الْقَوْسِ مَا بَيْنَ وَتْرِهَا وَمَقْبَطِهَا وَلَا حَجَ إِلَى الْقَلْبِ عَلَيْهِ أَيْضًا فَإِنَّ هَذَا مَا قَالَ الْخَفَاجِ That's actually something I already described. We don't have to translate that. إِشَارَةٌ إِلَى مَا كَانَتِ الْعَرَبِ فِي الْجَاهِلِيَةِ تَفْعَلُهُ This is actually talking about something the Arabs used to do in ancient times. So this expression, Qaba Qawsayn, has to do with Arabian culture. Let's see what it has to do with their culture. إِذَا تَحَالَفُوا فَإِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يَقْرُجُونَ قَوْسَيْن وَيَلْسِيقُونَ إِحْدَاهُمَا بِالْأُخْرَى So when two tribe leaders made a pact that we are going to fight as one, we are now united, a band of brothers, etc. So this is like a pact between two different tribes. They would take a bow from this tribe and a bow from this tribe and they would t- put them on top of each other, like stack them. They're stacking two bows on top of each other. Then what they, what they would, what, what would they do after that? مُلَاسِقًا لِلْآخَرِ So the arches are now on top of each other. Okay? Then, كَأَنَّهُمَا ذَا قَابٍ وَاحِدٍ As if it's one arch. ثُمَّ يَنْزِعُونَهُمَا مَعًا وَيَرْمُونَ بِهِمَا سَهْمًا وَاحِدًا Then they would pull, they would grab both the grips together. Then they would grab both the strings together. They would pull and they would shoot an arrow and the arrow is being shot not from one bow and arrow, it's simultaneously being shot from two bows and arrows, okay? This used to represent that now the, the happiness of one of these people is the happiness of the other. And what makes him upset makes him upset. We have now become one. So the idea of two bows becoming one was actually now what pleases you pleases me, what hurts you hurts me. We are an inseparable band together. We are quite literally tied together. We are knotted to get rope imagery, right? And by the way, interestingly, qab is also rope because there's a string in it, right? SubhanAllah, the imagery keeps building on top of each other. You guys, high school students here, one of the most boring classes you take in high school is English literature, where the professor's like, notice the imagery in this poem. Write an essay about the imagery in this poem. You're like, oh my God. Can I just, did somebody do a YouTube short video on this? Can I use AI now to write this imagery on this poem? That's what you guys are doing now. Um, But you know what? I'm telling you, English literature is going to help you a lot with Quran study. Take literature class seriously. Take poetry study seriously. Even take Shakespeare seriously. One of my favorite Arabic teachers in the world, advanced Arabic teachers in the world, I love him to death, is Sheikh Hamza Karamali. Some of you might know him. He lives in Istanbul now. Um, and he teaches, I've, I've learned so much about Balagha from him and you know, from his work. And often he'll just quote a speech by Abraham Lincoln. I'll start talking about Shakespeare and tie it together to linguistics in Arabic. And I'm like, that's a boss. That is, it makes me feel like a village idiot, but that's a boss. <laughs> you know? When you guys are studying English lit in high school, or you're taking, when you have electives in college, you're like, I don't know what to do for that. Take literature, take anthropology, take sociology, take things that help you understand the human mind, art, artistic language, because the Quran is incredibly artistic language. And it, it'll, it'll prepare you for it. Some of my best students, Quran students, are linguistic students and literature students. Like they, they just, they, they get things at a level that they help me appreciate things I didn't appreciate. So don't undermine the value of those things. And whatever your aspirations are, by the way, if you aspire to become a medical student because it's fard on you, because your parents are doctors, uh, or you... Uh, <laughs> um, or, you know, you, you aspire to go into tech or whatever else, do study literature. Because whatever these other fields, they're making you uh, skilled laborers. But study of literature, that's going to make you a, a, a thoughtful human being. 
right? I want you to be thoughtful human beings. Study of Quran makes you thoughtful, spiritually thoughtful. But it will be enhanced by your study of these other things. If we didn't understand Qaba Qawsaini like that, we wouldn't understand the fusion being made between Allah's Messenger Jibreel and Allah's Messenger Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wa Alaihi Salam. Right? There's this inseparability that's being captured here in Fakana Qaba Qawsaini aw Adna. And then he says, Fa'awha ila abdihi ma awha. And then he, re- he revealed, he inspired to his slave whatever he inspired. Like he could have just said, فَأَوْحَى إِلَيْهِ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ فَأَوْحَى إِلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ he, he revealed the Qur'an to him. He didn't. He said, he revealed to him, he inspired to him, he communicated secretly to him whatever it is that he communicated to him. مَا أَوْحَى There's an ambiguity mentioned here. Why is there an ambiguity? It's quite beautiful. This deliberate ambiguity in whatever he mentioned is actually for us to wonder what is it that he revealed? What is it that he gave? I want to know more. And you know what? Even if you've heard the Quran your whole life, Ramadan is coming soon. You're going to listen to the Quran in prayer. But have we really understood? Have we, do we really know what we're hearing? Is it still ambiguous to us? You know, there's this deliberate, you don't know anything about the Quran. You know, not, you just have these drops from this endless ocean. And that's inside. Ma awha. What it is that he inspired to him. I can spend my life studying Quran. I'll have drops from it. Just drops. I was studying a surah. We, uh, Suhaib and I were studying Surah Yusuf for a year. Whole year we studied Surah Yusuf. Like two years ago. And then last month, he and I decided to translate Surah Yusuf. And when we sat to translate it, we're like, we didn't understand it the whole year. New things occurred to us that didn't occur to us the entire year we were studying it. And I bet you, if we started studying Surah Yusuf again today, man, we got to start all over again. That's this Quran. It's the, there's this mystery to its wisdom. It keeps unlocking and keeps unlocking and keeps unfolding and keeps unfolding. It's incredible. And that's really the difference between tafsir and what? The dabur. Because when you become a person of tafsir with the dabur, then you come back and there's more to dabur. Then you come back and there's even more to dabur. And then you come and there's no end to the dabur. And then you keep, and then you find joy in finding other people that are doing tadabur because you're like, can you share your tadabur? I'll share mine. And then I share my tadabur with someone and they say, your tadabur made me have another tadabur. And that's what my group does all the time. We're like, they have a thought, then I have a thought. They're like, oh my God, that made me think of this. And I'm like, whoa. We're both, we're, we're all just like, Quran, dude. Okay, I need a break. I got to go eat a slice of pizza or something because I need to process this. I literally have to hang up on the group sometimes because it's just, ma oha. Then there's another ambiguity here that's amazing. He inspired. It could be Jibreel inspired. Because Allah inspired Jibreel and Jibreel inspired the prophets. Allah communicated to Jibreel. Jibreel communicated to the prophet. But he says, he inspired to his slave. The his slave clearly means the slave of who? Allah. Ila abdihi. So Jibreel is being conflated here. A, 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 a connection is being made where you can read this as Allah inspired it to his slave. Or Jibreel inspired it to Allah's slave. Multiple things can happen at the same time because there's now an inseparability between Allah, Jibreel, and the Messenger. A rope is being drawn between them and the ambiguity of the pronouns is capturing that. Then there's the word ma. One, one more aspect of the word ma that I want to share with you. Ma Ma is used for ibham in Arabic when something is not explicitly clear, when something there's more to be discovered. Part of the ishara here in the ayah is the Quran will keep on giving more and more and more. And it will always, there will never be a time where we can say we've exhausted the Quran. Now we know everything the Quran has to offer. Because it will always be ma'awha. There will always be more to learn from it. There will never be alladhi awha. Because the alternative to ma is what? 
الذي فأوحى إلى عبده الذي أوحى but it's actually ما أوحى so this is actually an inspiration for all of us to continue to explore the word of Allah and to bring ourselves to, to bring light to ourselves and to coming generations to continue this tradition of, of tadabbur in the ummah now this is what's gonna I'm gonna keep track of time because 11 and 12 is where it's at okay I have a little bit of time uh, to understand this ayah, uh, first, I'm going to take a sidestep and tell you something about the word lying in Arabic. Kathaba, kathib is a liar. Easy translation, right? But now you know nothing is easy in Arabic. There's the primary meaning and there's what? Secondary meaning. I'm going to teach you some secondary meanings of lying in Arabic. Kathib in Arabic, okay? Kathab al hurru. They say the, the heat did kathib when the heat breaks and the temperature gets nicer. So when it breaks, the temperature breaks, that's called kadhib. Kadhab al-aynu khanaha hisuha, when the eye sees a mirage and it thinks it's something, the eye did kadhib, it was deluded. Or it can't see straight anymore. It's not seeing clear vision anymore. Kadhab al-sayru idha lam yajid, when the animal is wobbling and the person is wobbling and they're not walking firmly, then their walk has kadhib in it. Then, كَذَبَ الْوَحْشِيُّ جَرَى شَوْطًا ثُمَّ وَقَفَ لِيَنْظُرَ مَا وَرَاءَهُ When the animal walks, but stops and sees if anybody's coming, then walks a little bit, then hesitates, that's called the animal is doing kadhib. It's weird. What does this have to do with anything? وَكَذَبَ الْقَوْمُ الصُّرَى And the, 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 the group of people, they couldn't travel anymore because لَمْ يَقْدِرُوا عَلَيْهِ they didn't have the money for it. They were too tired for it. فَمَا كَذَّبَ And they say about a person, this guy did not do takdeeb. They say that when this person didn't give up and he didn't become a coward and he fulfilled his job. So in other words, كَذَبَ also means to be a coward and to be a quitter. So كَذَبَ has to do with these things. And I'll, I'll give you the English notes soon. And so the ma'na mihwari means the overall theme is نَقْصُ الْحِدَّةِ وَالشِدَّةِ الْجَارِيَةِ فِي الشيء. When something is no longer as intense as it used to be. When something weakens, breaks, softens, that's actually called kadhib. So the meanings are decline in intensity or sharpness. The meanings of kadhib have to do with inability, losing toughness, um, or stamina is not one word. I was about to read that as one word. Or stamina. Uh, weakness, cowardice, uh, misconception and underestimation. Uh, also convenience. You know what that has to do with lying? This is the Arab saying, ancient Arab, even before Islam, the Arab understood something about the truth. The truth is the opposite of all of these things. The truth is intense. The truth requires ability. The truth it requires toughness and stamina. The truth requires bravery. The truth requires that you, under, you, you conceptualize properly. The truth is inconvenient. And when you run after convenience, when you're running after, when you're given to your cowardice, when you do all of these things, that's when lying becomes easy. People that are looking for the easy way become liars. That's kadhib. And by the way, so when he says, ma al fu'adu ma ra'a, now you know, when you, when you hear the word lying in Arabic, the associations they make are so powerful. They're actually, it's almost as if they did a psychological profile on lying. Right? Where does lying come from? comes from convenience, ease, cowardice. I'm too brave to tell you the truth. Like you know, for, for the guys here, your wife asks you, what you thinking? Not one of you will tell her the truth. Uh, this is work. It's really stressful right now. And in your head, you're giving a whole khutbah. If you knew what I was thinking. I don't know when judgment day is coming, but mine would start today. <laughs> Just tell me what you're thinking. No, too cowardly, too scary. Also, if I say the truth, life is going to become very inconvenient. I was not going to be convenient anymore. So it's better to just not say anything. This is, this is kathib, you know? So the idea of ma kathib al-fu'ad, this is a side note that whenever you read the word lying in the Quran, just I want you to have some thoughts about what's, what's behind it, right? Isn't this really beneficial like this to know the, the richness of the word, right? It just, it changes everything. 
Hey guys, you just watched a small clip of me explaining the Qur'an in depth as part of the Deeper Look series. Studying the Qur'an in depth can seem like a really intimidating thing that's only meant for scholars. Our job at Bayyana is to make deeper study of the Qur'an accessible and easy for all of you. So take us up on that challenge. Join us for this study, the Deeper Look of the Qur'an, for this surah and many other surahs on BayyanaTV.com under the Deeper Look section.